we're going to start with uh, some of the issues uh, that guys we create in our oversight committee, and we'll start with uh, Representative Silvin. Mr. Corbin, introduce yourself. So I'm just trying to make sure everyone has an opportunity to know who's exactly on the, on the committee. Hey, hi, I'm Regina Goodman, uh, state representative for Hospice. Pass the mic down. Here's a microphone. That's what it's for. Good evening. My name is Brenda Dale Southward. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. My interest so many of this on this committee is that I have a relative buried at Oak Lawn Cemetery. Thank you. My name is uh, Melvin Cooper, Bishop for World One for Christ Standard Life Ministries. Grew up right here in North Tulsa. I'm very interested in the history and the findings of all the things that are coming out. So I'm very excited to be here on this evening. My name is Chief Agamotti. I'm a shaman with the Tulsa African Ancestors Society of uh, Dallas, Oklahoma City, New Orleans, and Houston. Good evening. My name is Sherry Gamble Smith. I'm the President and CEO of the Black Wall Street Chamber of Commerce. Good evening. My name is Zach Bruce Kimbrough Jr. I'm the descendant of SR Kimbrough, who held the dentistry on Black Wall Street. My name is Inkim Ike. I'm a PhD student at the University of Tulsa studying after that for archaeology. My name is Michael Reed. My name is Michael Reed, and I'm a community activist, president of the Party. My name is Kevin Ross, a former journalist around town. My name is Robert Turner, I'm a pastor of a story regarding African Methodist Episcopal Church. Good evening, my name is Christy Williams, Vice Chair of the Greater Tulsa African American Affairs. Thank you. The purpose of the meeting this evening is to provide a detailed uh, overview of the mass race. And before we leave this evening, we hope that you will work as long as you can. Also make a presentation uh, and also we'll be hearing from uh, the mayor and councilor Paul Hart. And what I'd like to say is, in 1997, the House Warrant Resolution was passed by former Representative John Long from the line. And the purpose of that meeting was to establish a commission to study the 1921 head time of all race rights name has been changed to race massacre. But um, race was not included. It took four years for um, the meeting to um, go on. But at the end of, of the meeting, uh, the study was presented to uh, WCE in 2001 was to uh, leave it open so the commission could continue its, its study. Because one of the things that several things that were recommended in the, uh, in the study, which is um, to the you know, reparation, scholarship, economic development, and also uh, some type of memorial on the uh, people who died in the century. So, in that it was not completely concluded, we wanted to make sure that the commission to another house bill that was passed would keep people alive. So that brings us to the point where we can start again. Because at the time, I guess tell me back, why are we doing this 90 years later? Well, it wasn't resolved 
when the study was completed when, um, in 2001. So, in fact, I always say that we would be having this discussion are these meetings had it not been for Representative Trump because it was his platform and his political platform that uh, took away the dark secret. I guess they didn't take away the dark secret, but it opened up the door for a, a study. So tonight, uh, we are very happy that we're going to have um, a discussion. And, and also, this is the very first meeting, and Council Hall Conference is very adamant about everything being transparent. So she wanted to start out with a meeting here tonight. And so this is our first public meeting. So every, every step that is being taken, the feedback, the input that we're going to have from you, this is going to be reported back to the, uh, the, the committee. So without further ado, I will ask the mayor, and then followed by that will be Council Paul Harper. Then you will also hear from uh, city staff, and it's going to give you uh, an outline of the actual process that's going to be taken to do this investigation. So I thank you for coming, and I think you're going to find this very interesting. And before I sit down, one of the things will be uh, available to you is that you will have an opportunity to either have public comments, you can ask your questions here tonight, and if you're not uh, wanting to do that, you have also be part that you can put your comments or any feedback. We do want feedback from you, so please uh, feel free to uh, have a time to come to the mic or put your uh, questions on the um, card. There will also be a, a, a line uh, open for you to make uh, comments as well. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight, and I want to thank all of the members who committed to doing this the right way, in a transparent way, and I'd like to just take a few minutes to kind of explain how we got here, uh, at least from my vantage point. Um, it would be about, at this point, would have been uh, about eight years ago, there was a, a local journalist who did a, uh, an investigation that unearthed the information uh, about Mr. Brady being a leader, local leader of the Ku Klux Klan that ultimately led to votes to remove his name from a number of different city facilities. And that same journalist, after doing that report, uh, started doing a web series about other things in Tulsa that have been covered up over the years. And did one video from Oakland Cemetery that I was watching online, and he was talking about how there were potentially mass graves from uh, the 1921 race massacre in that cemetery. And as a city councilor at the time, and as someone who is a student of the history of our city, I was shocked by that. Uh, one, I'd never heard that fact before, and then two, it was difficult for me to understand how uh, a city in the United States of America in the 21st century could potentially have mass graves in its community and not have determined if they were really. And so uh, I started working with uh, my colleague on the city council, Jack Henderson, we met with the state archaeologist who walked us through uh, the work that had been done on this to date. And, and I really do want to thank Senator Horner, uh, one, for agreeing to share this, but Senator Horner has been working on this issue for decades, trying to do the right thing. Uh, her work on this is just a continuation. Um, but that commission back in the late 90s had identified several sites. Uh, and we're going to get into more detail here in a minute on those individual sites. Uh, but we found that there was ground penetrating radar that had been used that had identified anomalies that were consistent with mass graves in, in several different locations in Tulsa. And then uh, what the archaeologists told us was we just need, because the city of Tulsa has site control over these places, we talked to two of the three. One is a city park and the other is a city cemetery. We need the city to give us to go ahead to do it. And in our form of government, the mayor is the person who gets to get that go ahead. 
So we presented our findings to the administration at the time, and nothing happened. And it was really frustrating to me, and I thought at the time, if I am ever mayor, I want to be in a position to do the right thing. And was fortunate enough to get elected mayor, and then to have come into office at the same time I came as mayor of the council, a colleague who felt just as passionately as I feel about doing the right thing. So Councilor Hall Harper and I met with uh, the current state archeologist, the current state medical examiner, a range of different uh, experts on this front uh, to find out the technical side of how to move forward on this. Um, but we recognize that really two big things on this. One, that the technical side, the things we're gonna hear about tonight uh, is the easy part of this. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the science is advanced, the technology is far advanced from where it was the last time anybody looked at this. The challenge for us in this is just to be completely candid, uh, the city has not earned trust on doing this the right way. Uh, both in its actions to fail to protect Black Paulson during the massacre and to wait 98 years to actually start this investigation instead of doing it right after the massacre occurred. So we recognize that we needed to have folks from outside the city government providing oversight over this process who could provide transparency for the whole community around this process, uh, to be able to, to hold the city accountable that we're doing it the right way, uh, and to give reassurance to the citizens that this is being done the right way, or to point out if it isn't being done the right way, where we need to redirect. Um, I do want to thank, uh, of course, I'm very grateful uh, for the leadership that Councilor Hall Harper has shown on this, but also uh, the other eight members of our city council uh, unanimously supported the funding for this initiative. Uh, there was no debate. Every single member of the city council recognizes how important it is to do this work. Um, a couple things uh, that uh, I want to close with, and then I'd like to ask Councilor Hall Harper to say a few words. Uh, first, for a lot of folks, they ask, why, you know, why not just move on? Uh, why don't we just let history, that's in the past, what good does it do to look at this? And my answer to them, and I'm, I've been pleased that it seems to resonate and get through to folks, is that if you get murdered in Tulsa, we have a very basic contact with you that we will do everything we can to find out what happened to you and to render justice for your family. Uh, and our homicide department has amongst the best records in the nation in doing that. And in my mind, and I think in the policymakers of the city's mind, it doesn't matter if you were murdered two weeks ago or 98 years ago. No family in this community should have to have as part of their family story that an awful event happened and their family member just disappeared and they never knew what happened. That's not acceptable. Um, and that is why we're treating this as a homicide. From the legal framework, from the, the process that you're gonna be walked through tonight, that's how we're going about this. Uh, this is not just a, an archeological issue. This is a homicide from Tulsans who we believe were murdered in 1921. That leads me to the other thing that I think is so important as we go through this, is that we keep front and center in this at every step of this process. Who's most important in this are our neighbors who were murdered in 1921. They have to be in the forefront of all the decisions that we make throughout this process. The fact that their stories are shrouded by history, the fact that it's taken 98 years for us to try to find out what happened to them, I think it's so important that we keep them in the forefront of our minds. And as we go through this process, and that's another aspect of this, is that we want to tell the stories of those pulsants. And 
who they were before 1921, what they were doing in this community before 1921, that their lives were not just, they were not defined by the way that they died. But it is important that we understand how they died and that we make sure that we learn from that and that future generations of Nelson's learn from that so that history never repeats itself. And that's the last thing I want to close with. So it's very important that we involve young Nelson's in this process. I'm glad to see young Nelson's right up front for this meeting tonight. The fact that we had generations of Nelson's growing up in this community where no one talked about this is a disgrace. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you hear about happening in third world, or, or not even that, in, in sort of authoritarian regimes, not in the United States of America, and not in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And yet it, it almost did. It was almost a race. Thankfully, we had leaders like Don Ross. And by the way, Gavin, describing yourself as a local photojournalist is the most understatement of the year. Gavin is one of the most knowledgeable people on this issue in the entire city, and I'm so thankful that you're on. Uh, but thankfully, we had leaders like Don Ross and like Senator Horner who didn't let this slip through history and be erased. And now we have the opportunity to do the right thing, find out to the best of our ability what happened, and there are check there will be challenges along the way in finding that out without question because so much time has gone by. But we will do everything we can through this process to find out what happened, to tell the stories of those Tulsans who were victims in 1929, uh, and to make sure that future generations of Tulsans understand what happened, uh, and that other communities all around the country and around the world understand what happened so they don't make the same mistake that we made here in Tulsa. Uh, and so it's a great honor for me to be able to introduce my colleague, who's been such a leader on the council, not just on this, but on so many friends on the council hall. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, everyone, for coming out. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, as we continue uh, on this journey, it is so important to me uh, that uh, we move forward in this investigation uh, and that we have uh, co this committee and officials present. Uh, the highest level of transparency must be achieved as we move forward. Uh, as the national conversation of preparation goes on, it is important that the world knows that right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, we have bodies from the 1921 race massacre that was placed in unmarked graves and dumped in places like the Arkansas River uh, that is now called the Gathering Place today. It is my goal to make sure that our ancestors, who were br brutally murdered and placed in these mass graves, are given to their families and receive proper burial, and we as a city can have closure uh, to some degree. Uh, Chief Ingun Wale Amasan and Christy Williams would tell me how their friend, Otis Clark, a survivor from the massacre, always wondered what happened to his stepfather. He never saw him again after he was captured by a white mom. Uh, and there are stories of families who put out missing ads uh, and who have died, uh, who have died and never knowing, the family members have died, never knowing what happened to their family members and friends. Uh, and this is what is called soul work, S-O-U-L. Uh, and this is a work that we must do and achieve together. It is a part of justice that must be done. And our mayor has called this crime a crime scene investigation. And that is exactly what it is. And so all citizens will play a role in how we move forward and how we have achieved justice here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And that is what I am committed to doing. And again, thank you all for coming out. Hi, I'm Amy Brown, a Deputy Mayor for City of Tulsa, and I have the distinct honor and, and duty to ensure that we are approaching uh, the physical investigation part of this process appropriately. Um, it's no surprise to anyone in this room that this is not the City of Tulsa's area of expertise. 
Um, and so we really wanted to start by building upon the work that had been done previously um, by the state commission. So we have reached out to several of the experts who they did that initial groundwork. Um, and we've started putting together a team of technical experts to help guide us in the details of how this work should be done. Um, among those individuals are Scott Ellsworth, a professor of African American and African Studies at the University of Michigan. He served as a consultant to the original commission to study the Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, also, Dr. Judy Stubblefield, who is both a race massacre descendant and a research scientist at the University of Florida. Um, and also, um, Dr. Leslie Rankin Hill, who is an associate professor in of physical anthropology at the University of Oklahoma. And I think with the three of them um, and all of the work that they've done up to this point, um, we're starting from a good place. We, we're, we're not starting from scratch. We're building upon all the important work that's been done today. Um, joining us in, in this group and in this effort are our Oklahoma State archaeologist, Carrie Stoffelbeck, the mayor previously mentioned, and Councilman Parker mentioned some preliminary conversations with Carrie and her team. And also um, Amanda Ratner and Scott Hammerstead from the Oklahoma State Archaeological Survey. Um, they're kind of a new player in this. Um, when the work was done previously, the commission hired an independent company to do the ground penetrating radar work. Um, now the Oklahoma, or the, pardon me, the State Archaeological Survey has all of that equipment and expertise, and they regularly work with the state archaeologists, and so um, they emerged to us as a great partner in this work. Um, so we have a, a, a good, solid team. Um, it's also really important to us to include students. Uh, Dr. Odawali couldn't be here with us this evening, but we're very fortunate to have a couple of her students in the room um, because we want this to be an opportunity for them to learn from this process, to gain expertise, but then also carry this work into the next generation of um, archaeological experts. And, and we're very fortunate um, to have them join us as well. Um, so, First steps. Um, this team of experts is going to be joining us in Tulsa next week. They're going to be visiting the three sites. And their primary purpose is to help us clearly identify uh, the locations within, um, or the specific areas within three locations that we can use ground penetrating radar to scan and search for anomalies. And I think we have, um, yes, we do. Um, so those three locations are New Block Park, Oak Lawn Cemetery, and Rolling Oaks Memorial Gardens, formerly Booker T. Washington Cemetery. Um, you might be asking why these three locations. These were the three locations that were identified in the previous State Commission report. Um, I think that it's very important for us to have the Public Oversight Committee involved in um, deciding if these are still the three locations we want to start with. Um, I think we may have comments tonight about people who have heard stories or have oral histories in their family about other locations. And I think it's important to, to share those stories and we hope that the Public Oversight Committee will guide us in ensuring that we're looking at the right locations. Um, but to start with, um, we'll, we'll have our technical team in Tulsa soon and they're going to go to these three locations and based upon the previous work, um, identify some initial areas to be scanned. So the mayor mentioned that the technology has changed. I'm not an expert, so I feel bad that I'm the one to give you this technical information, but essentially ground penetrating radar now can view anomalies in the soil up to eight meters down. And our archeologists have told us that um, they would expect graves from this, this area to be located about two meters down. So what that tells us is um, the, the technology as it is now should give us more information, better information than we had access to previously. Um, our goal really um, is to identify the areas to be scanned, to bring the team back, actually conduct the ground penetrating radar, and then have the technical team report back to our public oversight committee and all of you as the community. Um, if 
the public oversight committee and the mayor and the community feel like it's the right thing for Tulsa to do an, a, an excavation. The next step is that we would obtain permits from the state um, and we would engage the uh, Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. And the reason for that is um, the Chief Medical Examiner has primary jurisdiction over human remains of any person of interest. Um, and that does not expire with time. Um, and so we would look to the, the Chief Medical Examiner to really, uh, to the main language, treat this like a homicide investigation. Um, that also requires that we would have um, sworn peace officers maintain the control of the site at all times in order to maintain the chain of custody for evidence because this would be treated like a homicide investigation. Um, it also means that if we were attempting to do some DNA matching, all of that would be done at a, um, basically a crime lab and um, would again be maintained with the chain of custody. So we really want to make sure that we're doing all of this the same way we would if we were um, dealing with a grave that was from someone who died yesterday. Um, so one, just a little bit of for your information, um, if the chief medical examiner decided to decline jurisdiction, um, then jurisdiction over the investigation would go to the state archaeologist, which is why we felt that it was important to include Carrie and her team from the beginning. So that we will have chain of um, information from start from start to finish. Um, the last thing is that we we're hoping to actually be able to conduct this ground penetrating radar this summer. Um, as the mayor mentioned, the city council um, approved the funding for that, so uh, the city will cover all of the costs of that initial ground penetrating radar, um, and hopefully we'll have results to share this summer. And then, to the mayor's point, the really difficult work begins of determining um, how do we as a community conduct an excavation? How do we ensure that remains are honored? How do we ensure that um, we're identifying who the victims are and, and their lives before their deaths, and how do we ensure that they're reinterned with dignity and honor? Um, and so, uh, we'll have plenty of time for public comment and, and questions about the physical investigation, but now I'm going to turn this over to. Thank you, Amy. Uh, as we were looking at national best practices for work like this that has been done across the country, um, in particular, talking with Councilor Paul Harper and Senator Horner about how important that public oversight and public input was, um, we built essentially three separate groups that will be helping us throughout this process. Um, so Amy spoke to the physical evidence investigative side of this. Um, I wanted to quickly cover the other two groups. Uh, first, uh, the public oversight committee that's chairing this meeting. Um, we will be in this process, uh, as well as the historical context and narrative committee as well. Um, the Public Oversight Committee really speaks to two core principles for the city uh, in this work. First, uh, that the investigation for the into for the 1921 race massacre be guided by the leaders of both the black community, um, and more particularly by the descendants of the massacre victims and survivors. Um, and second, that this process be transparent for our community, that it be accountable for our community, and that it be informed by insights and perspectives from our community. Um, so to accomplish this public oversight committee here tonight um, was created with a dual focus. First, to provide that public transparency and accountability at every stage of this process through meetings like this. Um, it will be held before any critical decisions or next steps are held in this process. Um, and second is to help lead the public conversation on really key decision points from the ones that Amy mentioned around excavation, um, how remains are treated, and how we commemorate where these items, where these um, remains are found as we go throughout this investigative process. So I want to speak really quickly to what that transparency looks like. Um, all meetings for the Public Oversight Committee will be like this, open to the public, um, and held in spaces that are accessible to the community. Decisions will be made in public with feedback from Tulsa's residents. And we'll be both live streaming this meeting, uh, Facebook, City of Tulsa Go, uh, if you're looking for that, for this and future meetings. Um, and also recording all of these meetings internally for the city as well, so that those unable to attend can be a part of the process, and so that we're archiving this for historical purposes as well. 
Um, key responsibilities for this committee will include reviewing the initial process and timeline of the physical evidence investigative team that you mentioned, which will occur in this group's next meeting on July 18th. Um, serving really as an advisory body for the mayor, the council, um, and the city generally regarding the investigative work being conducted. Um, and then meeting regularly with the physical evidence investigative team, um, updates on that progress, and to provide insight into how we want action taken regarding those findings. Um, I also want to speak really quickly to the fact that we're entering into a process with a lot of unknowns um, for us up here um, and for our community generally. And there will probably be a lot of difficult questions that we as a community don't have answers to yet. Um, and we firmly believe that those are not decisions that should be made in isolation without several input about public guidance. And so this public oversight committee will help establish a series of guiding principles for this investigation around key decision making points that we expect to encounter. Um, after receiving results from that physical evidence team. Um, so some of the key pieces that we've discussed, as Amy mentioned some of these already, um, if anomalies are discovered through that ground penetrating radar, should we excavate? Is that an important step for our community? We don't want to assume that that's the next step. Um, if we choose to excavate, how do we appropriately honor any remains that we uncover? And how can we best respect the cultural and the religious beliefs of the victims um, while those remains are being investigated and undergoing any kind of DNA testing. Um, also, how do we commemorate the locations where those remains are discovered and give them the honor that they're due? And how do we finally designate a final resting place for the remains to also give those remains the honor and respect that they deserve? Um, there are likely other questions that we'll need to answer throughout this process, and we'll turn to the public oversight committee and the Tulsa community generally um, in making those decisions. In terms of next steps, uh, the Public Oversight Committee will meet again with the physical evidence team um, and representatives of that team to review their process and receive public feedback and ultimately provide comments on that process. Uh, that meeting for one year will take place on Thursday, July 18th at the Rubis Civil Library. And again, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I want to thank Councilor Hall Harper and Senator Horner again uh, for both their guidance throughout this process and especially Senator Horner for being willing to lead this committee and for leading this conversation for our community for the last 20 plus years. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. <laughs> Finally, I want to really quickly touch on the historical context and heritage committee, our third group for this process. Um, it will have really three areas of focus, providing the sociological and cultural context to the investigation and ensuring that the beliefs and customs of the victims are centered in this work. Second is helping to guide the public conversation around this work, including efforts to continue educating Fultons on the race massacre and its aftermath and its lingering impact on our community, and providing guidance and historical expertise as we discuss the race massacre in our city's history at a national level. And third, chronicling this investigation to ensure that it is accurately documented and historically archived for our community moving forward and for future researchers, investigators, and the generations who come after us. This committee is being chaired by historian Hannibal Johnson and includes local anthropologist Dr. Alicia Odawale, um, who's also a part of this committee, and Dr. Bob Pickering from the University of Tulsa, Marla Mayberry from Blankston University, Francis Gordon from the Greenwood Cultural Center, and Ruben Gant from the John Lewis Franklin Center for Reconciliation, and Kim Johnson from the Tulsa City County Library, who I saw in the audience a little bit earlier, um, and Michelle Prince of the Tulsa Historical Society, both organizations that were involved in the Race Riot Commission's 2001 report. Um, we're also very fortunate to be joined by two individuals from the Smithsonian Institution. Um, one is Dr. Paul Gardulo, uh, Gardulo, I'm horribly mispronouncing that, um, who's the museum curator for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, and last but certainly not least, John W. Franklin, who is the cultural historian for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, and son of John W. Franklin, um, who has left such a more Um This committee will meet monthly to help guide the public conversation on this work, chronicling out information from that investigative process and provide historical and cultural guidance to the physical evidence team. Um, and then kind of finally speaking to how these committees will all interact. So members of the Historical Context and Narrative Committee, especially Dr. Odawale um, and Dr. Scott Ellsworth, who's also on the Physical Evidence Team, um, will both serve on the Physical Evidence Investigations Team, and Dr. Odawale obviously serves on this committee as well. Um, and that committee will attend the Public Oversight Committee meetings and help document the process and the feedback that we receive. Um, and then the Public Oversight Committee and the Tulsa community as a whole will receive presentations from that Physical Evidence Investigation Team prior to each decision point. 
and those meetings will be used both gather feedback from the public and make recommendations on that process. Thank you very much. At this time, uh, you will be able to utilize uh, if you don't have any questions at all. If you want to uh, take the line up here, the mic here. If I'll be coming forward, let me just say again, um, I need to be James before. Council Hall Harbor and the Mayor for taking this uh, to another level because I think it's very important because what happened on, on at the state level when it was not completed and even though and they left the door open so that this could continue on. So I am very happy that the city is taking this charge to move this forward and hopefully we are going to find because even in some of the uh, great sites that were visited. Uh, the conclusion was is that Palm um, Lake did not, them could not find any of the mass graves, but they just said that there were other areas that could be explored that probably had not been explored. So um, it did leave the door open for continued uh, study to go forward to try to find uh, answers uh, for um, those graves. So again, Mayor and Council Harbor, I thank you for your leadership and thank all of you for coming out. We will be allowed five minutes and I understand that the card will give you just uh, a warning when you uh, reach that five minute uh, level. So I uh, want to just encourage you to please speak but try to keep it within uh, five minutes uh, your questions and uh, we will try to answer as they present. Good evening. Uh, my name is Priscilla Morton Brown. I am a native person born uh, in the Ricky Grove community. There's a lot of people who do not know that also have a whole black community, which is Ricky Grove and Devon Church and Harvard, called the Lane First. Ricky Grove Cemetery back up to Gilbert v. Washington. I would like to know how were those three sites determined? Because if there were mass graves, if the riot spirit of Reagan and Parker and bodies were taken to the old Booker T at Lane First, is it possible there were also some buried at the Rainy Grove, which basically backs up to the old Booker T Washington? So that is my main question. How were those locations determined? And uh, can the Rainy Grove Cemetery be included in any further investigations into the next? So um, I'm probably a terrible spokesperson for the State Commission, but I will share with you what uh, Dr. Elson shared with me. Um, there's a location within Booker T. Washington Cemetery um, that a, essentially the, a, an older African American woman came to the cemetery staff and said, I know that people were buried in this location. and." Um, the scholars who previously worked on the State Commission had that same location, uh, heard about that same location from other eyewitness accounts. And because they had multiple accounts pointing to the same location, um, they decided that that needed to be a priority place to investigate. Um, we actually had some conversations with Dr. Ellsworth about IT Grove and, and um, the I, the graves that were found when that adjacent area was um, developed. And we we talked about the fact that because those are so close, there, there might be a need for the team to look in both locations. Um, so that's something that we'll um, for sure want to bring to the physical investigation team. It's something that we, I mean, we really hope that our historical context group will help um, provide additional information to guide the physical investigation. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that'd be really helpful. Good evening. Um, again, I would like to say thank you, Mr. Mayor. You pretty much fall down in history as being the first mayor to 
deal with mass graves. Uh -huh. yeah. I have walked that whole area, and I've been studying in the area for the past 15 years, uh, since uh, broke the store back in 2004. And <clears throat> that which grow is connected to that area, it's like a trail that connects that along with the Capitol Cemetery. Within the Capitol Cemetery, there's another area that was hidden and unknown and forgotten for decades, and we now know it to be Abraham Cemetery, but it wasn't declared a cemetery until 2009, 2010, when a group of us went out there and tried to find answers to what happened. I wouldn't be surprised that there's bodies uh, in Memphis Grove, because it was something, you look back in history, you'll see that they were quite busy trying to get rid of the riot there, the massacre. It was at all delivered speed when they did all of that. And so I wouldn't be surprised uh, for that. The bodies were buried all over the Tulsa, outside of the city of Tulsa. A lot of those secrets have died, but people who know better, they can tell us. So thank God for the intellect and the technology of the day that we don't have to do a bunch of things that we can just look on the ground by radar and find out. And I don't think that's a big task, just to go and look. That's what I feel. Thank you. And I, I'd like to add to that, because this came up in a conversation that Councilor Hall Harper and I had with Representative Goodwin, which is, we, we need to be real clear, this, these are the three start points. Uh, these are the three that scholars have pointed towards as most likely. That does not mean that if we have further scholarship that points towards other potential areas that we will just fail to look there. We just, we had to have somewhere to start and the scholars, the previous scholarship on this has pointed towards these three locations as a good start. Thank you. Oh, excuse me really quickly. I jump in really quickly as well. So sorry. For those that either don't feel comfortable coming up and making a public comment in the microphone um, or are interested in thinking about this more, providing comment after we're hearing other public comment, we have two other ways you can provide comment to it as well. First are the public comment cards uh, that Ashley is holding up right now. Uh, you should receive when you walk in. We'll be collecting those after this meeting as well if you'd like to submit your comments in writing. And we also have an online survey that's up with the link on the screen right now. Um, and that will remain up after this event is over as well. So you can comment on uh, this process if you think about it more and you need to talk to others. Uh, my name is Kim Wild. Thank you for having this meeting. It's an important uh, meeting to have. Um, my understanding is from comments earlier made uh, is that the end game is reparations. And if that's the case, um, how is one qualified to receive those and who pays the reparations? Thank you. Uh, I want to be clear that we're taking this one step at a time. Uh, the, the end game on this, for me, is to, to be able to tell future generations of Tulsan what happened and to be able to identify if something, if there are mass graves, A, and if there are, then are they related to 1921? That's a, a, a scientific detail that we're gonna have to deal with as we move along. There was a, there are potter's graves, which are like, for those who couldn't afford their own burial, they would be buried in mass graves in the early 20th century. There was a 1919 Spanish flu epidemic that came through Tulsa, where we understand people may have been buried, that folks who died from that may have been buried in mass graves. So there was a lot of work here to do every step of the way before we leap ahead to a discussion on reparations. And I know that there are are folks who feel strongly about that issue in particular, but I don't want, at least for me, for that issue to distract from the important work of first just determining if there are in fact mass graves in Tulsa, and if there are, uh, where are they, and who are the victims, and what happened. Uh, after that, I think then you have a discussion about Councilor Hall Harper's point and Nick Doctor's point 
about how they are properly honored and memorialized. And there are a lot of conversations that I think need to occur about that. Thank you. My name is Brenda Manster. This address for over three decades, and I do thank you all for finally doing it. I would like to know, uh, first of all, we have had previous city councilmen to come out to the grave site on my request and Mayor Bill of Fortune. Mayor Bill of Fortune and Bill Christensen promised me over two decades ago they were gonna do what you all are doing now, so I applaud you all. First of all, I am the owner of the Booker T. Washington Cemetery personally. My, my uh, great-grandparents and everything, and you can see it, it's been there, they've been there since the 1950s. They purchased three plots out there that made 30 grave sites. And there's only about 10 of us buried out there so far. When they turned it over to the Rolling Oaks, which is still Booker T. Washington Cemetery to me, because when they purchased that, how in the world of person to not purchase something that's already been paid for, first of all. I do, I did know them personally, and I would like to know, because I do know the owners had two sons. I do have, I remember one of them's name, uh, but I knew the comments real well. I can tell you, and also, former mayor Bill Christensen, I mean, Bill Fortune and Bill Christensen, there's a person on the house panel, I'm not gonna call his name. They know what happened to the graves. Those graves was buried all the way from the back of the Cummings house, all the way back across the east, where now they have built buildings over, they built houses over, they dug up the graves, and there's some person in this building that has some of the, I don't know if he has the materials now, but I feel like I didn't cause him to lose his job by going off into deep with me to get information about what happened with the graves. I hope this person has pictures. I still have some of my pictures. I uh, I think Bill of Fortune, I don't know what happened to the stove that was found when we were out there digging, but they know, and there's a whole lot of other people here in the city of Tulsa that know what happened to those graves. I do appreciate y'all doing an investigation because the next thing I was doing is asking for the Department of Justice because it's not right. And I do not believe that you can sell something to somebody that has already been hurt. So I feel as though I've been robbed. I have been robbed. And also, uh, in 2002, this is after I met with Buck, no, I met with Buck of Stump in 96 as well when they first purchased it. And they lied, okay? And they also said that they had the record showing that I thought had been already taken up. So in 2002, December 28, 2002, when I had to bury my, well, I didn't do it, his wife did it, but anyway, when we buried my oldest brother, Butler Stump stated, and his body was at Butler Stump, stated that there was no uh, more grave site in that area because they had all been taken up by the land master family, which is not true. But I will assure you, as recent as April or May of, two, of this year, where our plot is supposed to be. When I went out to the memorial, they didn't even know it was trees everywhere. It was, I'm walking to the man, Lad Manster's grave. A very personal friend's body is laid right there, who just been buried a few months ago, but they didn't have a room for my brother. In 2002, he buried way across from the back. I need some answers, thank you so much. If I may, I wanted the gentleman just previously uh, made a comment in regard to something that I'm very passionate about. 
Um, and I do I respect and I agree I would demand that this that is not under the purview of this committee. But I do think it is important that the citizens of Tulsa realize that there was major insurance fraud that occurred after the massacre of 1921. That there was capital physical damage in the range of 2.8, 2.5 million dollars of people that had their homes, businesses, churches, particularly the one that I pastored, destroyed. And the insurance claim and the insurance companies that they paid to every month denied that claim because they called it a riot. How would you feel tonight if your house burned to the ground and you go home and you see your house burned to the ground and the next morning you call your insurance company and your insurance company tells you, I'm sorry, but we won't pay this claim because they called it a riot. So this, this is a criminal investigation, I agree. Criminal procedures always proceed, civil procedures. But I think it is important upon the community and the citizens of Tulsa to realize that just as criminal damages happen, we know people were killed, civil damages happen as well. And none of them have been atoned for. The fire department did not go out and put out one fire break. The police department deputized the members of the white mob. So there's culpability all around. And to this day, not one dime had been paid. Now, if that happened to Southside of Tulsa, if that happened in Broken Arrow, how long would it take for, for insurance companies to pay the claim? So before we, I, and I have to respect and I thank God for the mayor and willingness to do this in an oversight committee, I thank God for that. I respect you for that. Um, and I do respect and understand the criminal procedures proceed civil procedures. But we as a community, if we value justice, we cannot forget that there's a strong civil case that his predecessor, he didn't think of, but his predecessor claimed the statute of limitations. That's a defense to what happened. How can you defend the indefensible? So now these descendants of the massacre cannot go and sue because a mayor claim, not this one, thankfully, but a mayor claim of statute of limitations. So we have to go to Congress now just to override that. And with the Congress we have, God knows what can get passed. And so I, I don't want us to forget, yes, this is a criminal focus, but let us not forget the civil damages that occurred and to this day have not been accomplished. What I would like to know is, do you know, or is there any type of record of every individual that was massacred in that crime? Is there a name to every person? Do we know the names? There's no record? None? Over in Oakland Cemetery, the two victims that are there that were massacred on June 1st, is only ones that we know that a name to them. And you see a physical marker there for them. And it is, of course, one of the highest suspected areas uh, where the right dead. Uh, to go back into uh, Sam Jackson, who helped bury the dead, the Jackson funeral home. Uh, in the interview in 1970, he talked about how he was told back then, just embalm the ones that are going out of town and leave the rest alone. And so there's no documentation. Oh, we really don't know. We don't know. We don't know. No. Yeah, you was leaving your life. Yeah. Yeah. If you was leaving your life and ask a question, why have these big businesses been closed down as an investigation? Because as me being an African American male, me going to the gathering place, me dancing, eating, putting a uh, picnic blankets on their gravestones, on their 
uh, all over their bodies where they're that way, that way. I did, that doesn't make me cope. Like, how can I cope with this? As me being a black male, I should not have to go outside and feel scared for my protection because my ancestors going all the way back. That's not fair to me. That's not fair to my cousins. That's not fair to my friends. I have been playing, prancing around, eating food on my ancestors, my friends' ancestors' graves. And I appreciate the man coming out and helping my race get this stuff figured out. Because this has been waiting for way too long. Way too long. And I feel like we, we I, I can't feel like because we all have been this. My black friends have been mistreated so much, it hurts for me to even come up here. I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to come up here because this should have been handled years ago. Years ago, this shouldn't have been handled. Slavery shouldn't have been a thing. But as my race, we have learned to overcome them. We have been bogged down in the most toughest situations, but we have came up. And we are taking back our rights and we want what's right. I like that. I like before, before you sit down, please give him another round of applause. What he's speaking about is the sacredness of land, of soil. Indigenous people have always valued the sacredness of land. And what you just described is what we talked about during the Brady Street Change fight. As a descendant of a survivor, I will tell them my son has to drive past the street named after someone who participated in the massacre. How does that, you, he is a living example of the trauma that is continually perpetuated on the psyche of people who still remember. Because we don't have we don't we don't have a past problem. We have concurrent problems. Right? Because it's a continuation of the things that we're trying to change here. So I really want to thank you because what we're dealing with in this project is going back to the soil and giving its sacredness back to the soil. Because you should know where you play. You should know where you dance. You should know where you go in this city where your ancestors, blood, bones, everything is cultivated in the soil. So I applaud you for your awareness and I hope that you will teach other people of your generation to, to think on the same, in the same way, to value and respect the place that we call the, the Greenwood District. Not just Black Wall Street, but an entire district. Where we're, what we're trying to do in this place is bring healing for people just like you and awareness. That's what we did when we rebuilt BC Franklin Park. We made sure that the legacy of BC Franklin was part of that process. It was like, if we're gonna rebuild this park, let it be in the name of somebody who helped rebuild Black Wall Street. Because had it not been for B.C. Franklin, we wouldn't even see what we see today. So thank you so much. And we will honor sacred land. That's one of the reasons I chose to be part of this team, because that's what the African Ancestral Society does. We did the same thing in Dallas, Texas, where they built Highway 75, right over the uh, African's burial branch. Freedom Cemetery, and they have a beautiful memorial. They return the bodies. They did everything that we're trying to do now, so that the people in that community could say they didn't just they didn't just take the crap on our history and our legacy. We're trying to bring historic justice for people just like you. Thank you. Most of you know me, not all of you. I'm Brenda Berry. I ran the Social Studies Department of the for 30 years in student council, and I taught the truth. I always taught the truth. And when I would be teaching, I would be talking about the white power structure in history and what it did to people of color. 
And then I have to explain to my students, I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about the power structure. But the one reason, the main reason I came up here to talk was back in the 1980s. Hang on. Hang on. Thank you. Yeah. Without any talks, my customers. And this young man walked up to me. He was still on his father's grandfather's farmer. And he said, my grandfather told me that they buried mass graves all along the river in East Dawson. And that was the main reason I came up here to let you know that. Because we need to go a long way to go to a mass grave. Thank you. Okay, my, <clears throat> my name is Yvette Hill. My family's been here for over 189 years in Oklahoma. We have the oldest native cabin in Oklahoma, next to the Choctaw's cabin. Uh, what I wanted to say is that we always talk about African American. Africa is Africa, America is America. But what we need to talk about, the indigenous people that were here in Oklahoma, we totally erase them. We have been replaced and erased. Black Indians had all this land here before we had blacks to come in to Oklahoma. They came to the Trail of Tears with everybody else, y'all. I keep trying to tell y'all this. However, it offends me when we always say black. My grandma wasn't black. She, was, she said she was colored, okay? But she was an Indian. She was part of the five civilized tribes. She looks like me over weeks. We don't have white in us for over 250 years, y'all, and we look like this. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. That's an Indian right here. Thank you. He's on the roll, okay, as an Indian. Thank you. On the roll as an Indian. All these are Indians, okay? I just, I mean, I'm very scared to talk to people, but when we don't look at the truth, about things. We need to go back in history and find out the people that had most of the land here in Oklahoma, Harvard, uh, that was us. There were a lot of this land, you guys. Okay, when we start talking about this, reparations and everything, we need to go back to the history. They were black Indians. They don't want to call us Indians. You know, they don't want us to be a part of their tribe. But guess what? We are still indigenous Aborigines. We are Indians. We were here before everybody else. Please. We were here before everybody else. Now, we did have some guys to come over. And I don't know if you are not Indians, right? You guys are not Indians. I know they're family. Okay. They, they're Creole, right? Cherokee. Okay, but I'm just saying, uh, we, we came through the trail with everybody else. We are Indians. We're indigenous Aborigines. Okay. We need Congress to come and find out why they uh, assimilate us and to eliminate us and how they erase us to replace us. Okay? This is our land first. Okay? This is the reason why we're not in charge, most of us. They didn't want us to mix it with the blacks, they said. Okay, this is the secret, y'all. Wake up! We had, we, yeah, paper genocide. We were here already. My family got hundreds of acres. Still. Okay? That's the real secret. The secret is we're the Indians. That's the secret. Okay? Uh, that kind of business when we were always say African My grandma said we're not African American. She said we colored. We're not black. They can call us Negro if they want to, but we're Indian. Hello? The other thing I want to say is that. I was told that uh, on the trip, I was told about the about the race ride. I was told that I talked to a man. He told me that they took our people on the train. I didn't know nothing about this. I'm, I lived in California. My father, my father was worked for American Airlines, so I came back and forth. The bottom line is, 
God allowed me to, 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 to meet a man. He was in his 80s. He said he had to tell me something. And I wasn't going to talk about this tonight. I was going to put it in the paper, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Because God knows people know me. I'm not going to be lying about nothing. He told me this. He said they put these people on the train and they took them out there by ECC and they buried them in a quarry of uh, Dawson. Do you remember Dawson? Dawson, but he was in a. Uh, I don't even know they make bricks underground. He said he was in a. a, in a, a, a they. A, a, a mine underneath the ground and took these people. This man's father was an official, city official, worked for the city. It was his ground and his stepfather. And he told me this. So they said, they put him on a train, took him out there by TCC and uh, so forth, and took him over by uh, Acme Brick and buried him in that area underneath the, uh, that, that, that uh, area. You call it, uh, they, they put him underneath there. That's what I was told. So in the city, people in the city know this. It was a, uh, what do you call it, a, a, a mine or what have you? A, a court, a, a court. So this is what I was told to happen. And God gave me this information. I knew about it over 10 years ago. But there was nobody really listening to me at that time. And I wasn't going to say anything. I was going to put it in writing and make it just give it to somebody. So talk to the pastor about it. But this is what I was told. Was the people are buried underneath in this rock court. And that was, a, when I think about it, it's a pretty good place to put people. You don't want them to find out where they were. I think of what I just wanted to uh, address what uh, the lady said. I am a pretty free, and uh, I recently uh, was able to trace that family history back um, and didn't realize it was so close to me. But my mother's family is pretty, where we are pretty freemen. And so I understand exactly what you are saying, and I understand the history because there was a time before Oklahoma became a state. This was Indian territory, and it was only Indians and black people who could own land here. And I also understand that my family was enslaved by Creek Indians. And I also understand the importance of the treaties and the land. Uh, but this work that we are doing, uh, on this committee is very powerful because a lot of those bodies who are in those mass graves are also Creek freedmen, Cherokee freedmen, and even with the history of Greenwood, Josiah Perry, Creek freedmen. I think the last two speakers have raised a really good point that I want to make sure we're really clear on moving forward. Uh, after there was a lot of when uh, Councilor Hall Harper and, and uh, Ms. Williams were featured in a story in the Washington Post and, and we started talking on a national level about how the city was going to move forward with this. One of the really remarkable things that came of that was that all these people came forward through, luckily, through social media, sharing oral histories from their families, just like we heard from the last two speakers, uh, stories they, that have been passed down in their families about what their ancestors had seen around potential grave locations. And what we quickly realized was there was this tremendous wealth of oral history in this community around that that had never had a public venue to collect it and organize it and document it. And uh, both Dr. Owale and John W. Franklin raised the point that we need to have a system to make sure that we collect stories like that one and like the previous speaker had and like so many other people have brought forward before the folks that know those things aren't around anymore. And we have to document that so that we can follow up on those in a proper way. That is one of the key responsibilities of the historical context and narrative committee that Mr. Doctor was talking about 
uh, earlier in the presentation this evening, is to collect those oral histories. So if you have those in your families, if you know people who have knowledge like that and stories like that, we implore you to bring those folks forward, bring those stories forward so that we can, so this committee can collect those and organize those and document those so that they can be properly followed up on in the future. Thank you.
the 40 acres that is in operation there now is what it on this map. This section is as far north as the cemetery goes now. All of this from here back to Nordown, even though it was on this map, we can see it would cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars to flat this out. There are 1,000 people buried to one acre. So, I was told by Mr. Grant Hastings Jr., the person that we purchased the cemetery from, that there was a mass grave here at Ground Hill. Wow. I was told that there was paperwork sealed and somewhere downtown at the courthouse that could not be opened until 75 years after the death. I was also told by Mr. Hastings that that is why overnight they decided not to sell or use any of this property. No one in business would forfeit that type of potential profit and growth. I don't know that it's there. I wasn't born until 66, so I can't say what happened in 21. The earliest burial of record at Crown Hill is 1908. Even though they say the cemetery started in 1930, I believe some of those were convenient dates to have someone look the other way. I've always thought that. I have been in contact with the current owner. We have discussed that. And we both think that there are a few places out there that show sign of that type of carrying on. I was also told there was a mass grave in downtown Tulsa near the American Legion. I am aware of the graves that are out further south of Calgary Cemetery along the riverbanks, and I understood that that was something that happened prior to that, it predates this, and it was for the most part predominantly Native Americans in those graves. I was also told that there was a large amount of people that were being cremated and the ashes were being dumped back there in what should be section seven. There is no section seven, there is no records of anybody buried in section seven at Crown Hill Cemetery. So, can I swear to anything? Uh, it's all hearsay at this point because none of us were there. However, I would suggest that there's something in there that might lead people in the right direction. And uh, Pastor, I heard you speak of statute of limitations, and, and that stands true for property damage and things like that. However, there may well be a way because there is no statute of limitations on homicide. And when there are other felonies attached to those crimes and acts and deeds and so forth, they may well be. However, there's nobody left to prosecute, not even the conspirators of those crimes. I'm very curious what's back there. This is my personal property. Uh, I've known that for 15 years, and I've suggested more than one time that it might be looked into. Thank you so much. I want to say before the next speaker, I want to say absolutely. Mabel Little spoke of bodies being buried there at Crown Hill, and that's what she was told. She would then pass that on to Janetti Marshall and a number of other folks. So that has always been uh, the story that bodies have been buried there at Crown Hill. So I think you're right on target. All right. I'm Dr. Gwyneth, this is Ambassador Scar Williams, the daughter and granddaughter of Bishop Otis Clark. And I just want to give um, just a thank you for what you're doing. And we honor you. And I was actually looking at the nine minute documentary today that was done. We traveled with the Race Riot Committee for over seven years. We took, we actually went before the Senate, the mayor courts. We actually watched my dad go up the steps taking the brief to the Supreme Court, actually looking at John Hope Franklin today on the video 
and hearing him speak, you know, of righting the wrong. I believe this in my heart that those that are that are in the grave, they need a proper burial or memorial. That's, you know, what I really believe. If the city could work with that. My dad did so many interviews. This didn't just go national, it went international. He said he had people from South Africa come here, interview him from France, the New York Times, Washington Post, you name it. We even have pictures of him at the great sites. But I was sitting here and I was just thinking, it's like a repeat of everything we've done. You know, all the work that Scott Ellsworth done, he did, it's all documented, listening to all of the lawyers. We have the best lawyers, Dr. Ogletree, who I talked to a couple of months ago. He has Alzheimer's now, his wife let me talk to him. You know, the work has been done. Spending time with Ed Gates, you know, your dad, but I think what we need to do now is as we follow through that those people have a proper burial. Now, as far as reparations, we were told about the statute of limitation that the time had already been set. This wasn't the only time it went to the Supreme or if you check the records, and Dr. Ellsworth can tell you in 20 as well. But one of the things as we presented, we went to the CNN Center, even during Black History Month, we were able to go to um, Procter and Gamble and talk to the people and have our panels. UCLA, we, we, all the colleges. We went to um, IUPUI the African-American schools to present this case. But one thing in my heart, I believe as a culture, and I love what you said, because my dad would always say, don't forget about the Indians. <laughs> he was born here when it was Indian territory. I remember when they honored him in the state capitol downtown, I said, dad, you're older. You know, you're older than the state. <laughs> you're older than this building. But his heart, even when he went and he talked to the people, they were saying, you want to tell what happened? And how many of you know this phrase? On God's side, you what? You're on the right side. You're on the winning side. And right here on Greenwood, we have the footage. He had Johnny Clary, an ex Ku Klux Klan, and shined his feet, shined his shoes. But guess who mentored him? A Baptist, a black Baptist preacher mentored a Ku Klux Klan. I think the whole bottom line of all of this it's not my rights, it's not the Indian rights, it's like it's God we forgive. That's hard. But my dad taught that. We just got back. We've been gone for four years over a five-year period. When we were in Japan, the Japanese gave rings to those people from Korea. But the Koreans, some of them, they didn't like the Japanese. They were actually protesting and burning the flag of Japan and burning up the pictures of the Japanese president. Why? Because the Japanese killed, sure, killed 20 million Asians. 20 million. When we were in Korea, some of those people were leftist children in the hunting buildings and had to fight the rats to get their food. We all gone through something. We spent six months in Israel. And they told their stories of how they were left in the woods as little children, the survivors. 
because of the Germans. We spent a year and two months in Africa. Our black tribe, each of us are from, we do our DNA. You probably from one place there. We have some African blood, but they're fighting against one another. The Kukuyus. And it's all about land. It's all about what someone owes. So my part here today, my five minutes is up. I told my daughter, she's a Miss Oklahoma. She's a Miss Black Oklahoma. And Miss Christian Teen Oklahoma. <laughs> and she's a Miss Global Ambassador. But our heart is, I believe, this is my belief and my dad's belief, when we release what has happened to us, we will get a great recompense of reward. And I often tell this story when my daughter ran. I had a relative come on that told me the first year. She said, Come. They didn't give her her crown because she's black. No, it's not the color of our skin. You can be Native American. You can be Indian. You can be from wherever. Has created us all equal. But the next year she went back and she was A Miss Oklahoma top 10 in Miss USA. But guess what? That was 100 years from the day, from the year my dad was born in Oklahoma. God will bring that great recompense of reward. They are key. Uh, and I honor our mayor and um, Mrs. Horner and all of you, the good ones, all of you for what you're doing, but let's stay together. And we just, I'm kind of coming as a minister. I believe when we stay together and we don't fight and bicker, we're going to get this done. But there's in unity, because we can no longer blame one another. Look at the person next to you and say, we're better together. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. I did know what she said, and I believe also having a, a burial, honoring those who were, who were killed, and providing a new future that we don't repeat history. Amen. And I believe it's time for Tulsa to arise to the occasion and to be that city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. Even to the nation, to the world. Because they will be looking to see if we can do it, they can do it. So thank you so much for this opportunity and for all that you are doing. We'll be praying for you as well, um, for your success. And I'm believing and standing for the next generation that they can stand up and be all who they were called to be, and that they will move forward um, in their God-given destiny and in hope. Thank you. And for all you preachers, you know Ezekiel 37. We decree that those dry bones, <laughs> those dry bones that are in those graves, that they shall rise again, and we shall live and not die and not Tulsa to rise in unity. Amen, amen. And as my dad would say, he would say, those of you who know what he would say, amen. spiritual about the committal when you say ashes to ashes and, and dust to dust it's something and for those 
who were slain. Um, they have never received that. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly and I made that a proposal to, to the mayor and um, I pray that when they are found that you hear more about that. My name is Melanie Harbin. I am a former committee member at the Center for Racial Justice. I, um, me, Kevin Ross, and Deborah Perry Chambers worked very closely together on an area that we feel very strongly that there are some victims. Um, we believe that when the Race Right Commission went to three of the sites, they were close to one, but there were trees hiding where the real people were that they couldn't see. When you go to Rolling Oak Cemetery, there is a tree line and there is a ditch and there is no access to it. And there has been a gated community that's been built on there. Now, every time that we would go out there, the grave sites would continue to disappear. We would see hundreds of temporary grave markers that had the Jackson Memorial stamp on it, but the papers that were in there were gone because of, they were just too old, but the stamp was, it was increased into like 10. So the research that we did, we found that the owner of Jackson Memorial was in charge of disposing some of the bodies. He was actually made to. And we feel if he had a chance to give his people a proper burial, he would put them there. Because that was a known black cemetery then, and it was called Abraham Lincoln Cemetery. Um, every time we go out there, the last time we've been out there, you can't even see, not even one gravestone. I videotaped all of it. I videotaped us going down to land records, because we couldn't even find, you know, uh, any records that it's an actual cemetery, and we're looking at it as a cemetery. We did a lot of work, but we found it. We found who owned it, and who owned it was uh, Butler Stump. And we even looked further to see who the developer was that was developing on that site, and they actually have the same office together. Wow. We interviewed her when we were members of the Center for Racial Justice with a lawyer that was a former member, and she said, you know what, this has been a pain in my butt. You can just take, I don't even want it. All the publicity, all the stories that Kevin was writing about it was embarrassing her. She said that you're going to be responsible for building access over it. Because there's no access to it now. There's a trench. And she said that she uh, said it's going to cost like $100,000 to build a bridge that would support the weight of, I don't know how, Oh, oh, anyway, who knows? Um, uh, what else? I think the oral history, they were looking in the wrong area. And um, just seeing all those temporary grave markers from Jackson Memorial, um, I think you really need to be looking at it. And we actually got the state archaeologist to come out there. And I videotaped that. He was out there, and he said, you know what, I was out here when they were building the Creek Turnpike, and they came across some Creek Freeman, or some graves, and he determined that they were Creek Freeman graves. And he, he told them, you're going to have to go further out this way so that you don't disturb these. And he's sitting there standing with us, looking at these houses in this gay community, and he said, I told them they couldn't develop here, and they did it anyways. Wow. So I got that on tape. Anyway, we have so much information. Um, when we were down at the land records, um, us uncovering, you know, the connection between the developer and um, Butler Stump, that they have the actual same office because there's an actual business complex there that's called Ashton Creek Village, and um, I just think there's um, some criminal activities happen. They knowingly. It's very upsetting when someone has put, been put in charge to oversee some people's loved ones. And they've got the Rolling Oaks in the front area where everybody can see and they've done it. But they, it seems to be that they've been, they were selling 
the forgotten part that was sitting in the woods and developing over it until somebody called Kevin and said, hey, they're digging up bodies out here and building houses on top of it. And because of him going out there, that's why we were able to stop them from going any further and preserving them. They've been out there. When we've been out there with the state archaeologists, they, because we've been going out there a lot, there was actually one of those motion sensor cameras out there, you know, like out in the woods for Bigfoot and stuff for us, and I was kind of happy. I was like, right, they're going to see the state archaeologists on this. So um, there's been some serious criminal activity um, when it comes to that site of not honoring and it just disposing because there's no record. They, I really think they thought they were going to get away with, with it. So, anyways, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, I would to add to that. I was uh, out there just recently. I hadn't been out there for quite a while. Cause I get mad every time I go out there and the structures to this area uh, just south of that creek. It's Hanky Creek, but now they call it Ashton Creek now. And in part of our best case, in fact, then about 15 years ago, we noticed not only that it was in the court records, like Booker T. Washington Memorial Gardens that were built in 1924, uh, that establishes Booker T. Washington. It was also two other Booker T. Washington uh, Memorial Gardens that was created by the same people around the same time. The other one is created, uh, is located on 46th Street between Lewis and Peoria. So even back then, you know, when you look at the paperwork, it's like, which line they gonna stick with? Outside, there's bodies, but there's no documentation. Out north, there's documentation, there's a great yard, there's houses on top of that. So it, it's really need to be investigated. It should be investigated a long time ago before we got to this point. Uh, I was recently out there a couple of weeks ago, uh, about a week ago, and I saw that same area that uh, Ms. Patterson was talking about and where I saw there was a temporary markers, they all pulled up. The ones they had the names on them, they were all pulled up. The, the lawn prints that were there, torn up to pieces. Now, I said this before, but some people got mad at me, but I'm gonna say it again. If this was a Jewish group, it would have been held to pay. If this was a Native American graveyard, it would have been hell to pay. But the developers and the persons who did it struck and said, hell, let's get paid. And that's what they did. So we need to be able to do the right thing on our watch. It's our turn now. Other people tried, many people did not get anything. But now it's on our watch. And thank you so much, Melanie, for coming forward. I just want to add to your point that there is documentation. You've seen it, I've seen it, a number of folks have seen it as it relates to bodies that femur. It was identified as a femur. There were bones that were discovered. Uh, officials in Tulsa know about it. Uh, you all, we've had this conversation. So there is documentation to uh, um, burial furniture being moved. And also, uh, the, the bottom line is this a crime was committed. Folks knew about it. Folks were told they better be quiet about it, and they were. And the bottom line is, if we have documentation, TU, Tulsa University, has the documentation, we have the documentation. And uh, it's just that folks didn't want to do the right thing at that time, that was like 2000, prior to 2004. So there's a lot of work to do. Uh, there are a lot of bodies that have been buried in a lot of places. There's a lot of coral history, and we've got, uh, really uh, real work to do. And I would say this, as it relates to all folks that are descendants of, of, of folks that either had property lost, uh, you know, we had, we had buildings burned in our family. We certainly have oral history in our family in terms of what happened during that time period. But for all of the stories that we all have collectively in Tulsa, the bottom line is this, we gotta have white folks come forward, tell their stories, because I guarantee you, the oral history that we have, they have the same history in their families. And we Amen. need to, to, to engage even more white folks to come and tell their stories because they too know where the bones are there. So um, we get along further and faster together. Right. Uh, I just want to bring you this up. Uh, my name is Murray Amen. I'm the publisher of Downtown Folks News. And I'm also the president of the Folks Black 
historical society. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the panel for what they're doing. It's timely. I've been collecting history since 1977, and I uh, thought it was time for me to come out that community to know what we're about and what we're doing. Now, my purpose for coming here tonight was to say to the panel and to those who here that have stories, we'd like to video uh, an in interview talking with you about your findings and about the stories that you'd like to tell. And uh, my number is 918-671-1089. Or you can uh, hit me with the uh, email, Tulsa Black Historical Society at gmail.com. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rico Wright, Black Wall Street Gallery. Uh, the mayor alluded to an individual who, during his investigative journalism, had many criticisms of Tulsa. He unveiled many a secret about our dark past. And this young man's name has yet to be mentioned in this space. And so I want to say his name because this man, to my mind, lost his life. They claim that he committed suicide, died of illness, but anytime you speak truth to power, you show that type of courage, you know you pose a threat to the system. And this man, Leroy Chapman, is the individual that lit a spark in this city. And it's sad that sometimes it has to be a white voice to speak in order for black voices to be amplified. But be that as it may, I am grateful that this man took the stand because it's, it's opened the door for people like Chief and Christy and Vanessa to speak their truth and finally be heard, which is the way it should have been long ago. We shouldn't have to have this conversation 98 years later. But I thank this committee and I thank whoever assembled this committee to have the individuals who are truly speaking truth to power to serve on it, to represent us, to bring us to some closure. I really, who, who assembled this? <laughs> it was the one, but thank you. Can we give it up for the lesson? <laughs> no, can we all stand up and give it up for the lesson? Yes, please. talking about an architect of social justice, that's Vanessa Hallmark. And once again, I want to say his name, Leroy Chapman. Leroy, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, CJ Hill. I'm a local reporter here with uh, the Oklahoma Eagle newspaper, but I'm coming here today to speak to you as a citizen. I have in my hand a picture of my great, great grandfather. His name was, or they used to call him uh, Tory Weber. He was a local person that was here in the Greenwood District. And when the race riot occurred, he somehow got his family to safety, but he was what was called light enough to pass during that time. So when the gentleman from the cemetery just stood up and brought out the map of the same cemetery that my grandfather said that he was recruited to go down and bury bodies there, and then because he was considered to be Native American was told, don't you tell anybody, boy, because we know where you are. That just sent chills to me. He provided for my grandfather the story my grandfather who passed away uh, around 2005 2006 wrote an affidavit which we still have in our family that we have kept and i want to say to the commission i'm glad that everyone is meeting today i'm glad that everyone is speaking today about what's going on but it's something to say that in 2005 my grandfather was so scared that he still didn't want to turn over that affidavit, even though many, many years have passed since that riot occurred. 
I read the affidavit. When I was younger, it was something that was just brought up in the family, and the story was told, as I'm sure many people that are here today have told stories, and that's the reason why some of these sites were able to be located. But for this board that's meeting together here to talk about the investigation that needs to go forward and defining our loved ones who passed away because of homicide, no other way to put it, it was just straight homicide. What is going to happen from this point forward? The community can come together and we can speak as everybody has spoken here today about their concerns and about what needs to be done and about possible sites. But what's going to happen from this point forward? Now, I have to admit, I'm not a native of Tulsa. My family's been here, but I'm from a little town of Choctaw that's close to Oklahoma City. So the only time I ever really came to Tulsa was to visit family members and I, I haven't been here that long. But I see the pride of the people that have lived here for years that went through riots and rebuilt, that went through gentrification and rebuilt, or retained their land, that went through bypasses being built over places and things being torn down, and they're still here because they have roots. They have pride in who they are and who their family is and, and what this community represents. The affidavit that I have, I'll be more than happy to turn over so that way you guys can take a look at it. But in that affidavit, he tells the story of what happened in the days after. Now, the official version is, I know that some of you have probably heard it, and I'm paraphrasing, okay? But that the National Guard surrounded the city in order to try to keep this thing contained while it went happening, and then immediately after it happened, then the National Guard, you know, they came in and was trying to set up camps and everybody for everybody to go to their certain places. We know that the Brady Theater was one of those places of internment. We know that there were other sites that were there. In the affidavit, my, my great great grandfather wrote that he was picked along with a few other Cherokee citizens and white citizens and people that could pass. And the person that went and got it said, look, Tony, I'm coming to get you because if I don't, they're going to try to kill me. He said, just come with me, because this is the only way I know how to keep you safe. This is the same man that helped his family get out by putting them under a car that was wheeled out of town that actually had some of the bodies on top of it, but they had slid underneath there my great-great-grandmother and his child. This is a picture of him. This was the house that they used to have before it got burnt down in that massacre. So he went along with it, he agreed, and that's what he said. He said they went out to that cemetery. He said there was shovels out there, and people were laughing and joking, talking about, oh, well, I shot this one, and he was coming out of this one, or did you see that little baby that was coming through? All of this is in there. But he talks about the fact that there is a mass grave that has been there, and that some of those bodies, not just there, but some of them were carried further away than that, as far away as Wahuska, Oklahoma that there are bodies that are still buried there. So, yes, we're having an investigation here in Tulsa, and yes, we're doing all this, but my question is, what's gonna to happen to all the other places that are outside of the jurisdiction of this city? Where do we go from on a state level in order to find out where these bodies are? Because not all the bodies were here. Some of them were cremated, true. Some of them were buried here, true. But some of them were put on trains and carts and taken away because they wanted to, as in any crime, get rid of the evidence. If there's no evidence, there's nothing to pin that you were at fault. So my question to the community, I guess, would be this, and not only just talking about what I just talked about with my story. You all are meeting here today, and I know that we've got state representative, I know Councilman Vanessa Parker, I've talked with her a couple of times, I haven't really gotten a chance to you know, introduce myself and really get to know her, but I do know this, she's been a fighter in this. I know Maxine Horner, I interned her many, many years ago. I know she's been a fighter because the lessons that I learned about Tulsa, I learned from people like Don Ross, who was a state representative who would talk about this is what happened. So what's going to happen at this point beyond the city of Tulsa, beyond us going through and digging through the sites? 
Are people going to be able to find their loved ones and finally find out, or at least as close as we can, find out what the truth of this whole deal was? What I do want to say to you is that we are getting information from actual uh, sheriffs today, white sheriffs, that are talking about they know where bodies are buried outside of Tulsa in terms of oral history. So, just so you know, we are getting those reports, and, and certainly it's going to be up to the mayor and the councilwoman uh, uh, exactly how that will be handled. But we are getting those reports, so I want you to know that we're getting, I think, some good good. But I'm, I'm very grateful for Representative Goodwin because I really attribute a lot of her leadership is the reason that we've had so much assistance from state agencies on this. And, and that's a very important thing. It's not just that they are lending their expertise to help us in Tulsa, but they represent, they work for the whole state. And, and that's the other thing. If there is a if a Tulsan, if, if somebody is murdered in Tulsa, the location of their body doesn't mean that suddenly it's out of our jurisdiction and we can't follow up on it. Uh, that we will continue to utilize the legal apparatus at our disposal to follow through on that. And again, I'm just really thankful that we have such. Uh, there's been no hesitation from the state in stepping up to assist us on this because I think they get it like we do. Uh, that this is a it's a homicide investigation. Okay. Uh -huh. On what uh, Representative uh, Goodman has spoken about, it's been on my mind since we first started trying to meet about those descendants of the perpetrators and planners to invade Greenwood District, that we pursue getting those descendants to come and speak to us. It's kind of like uh, when families get together and they talk about what's going on, and I'm sure some of those descendants and children and grandchildren were involved in some of those meetings. And they know the story, so it would be a good cleansing, soul cleansing experience for them to get that information out for our cities to turn around and come up with new directions away from the days of Jim Pro time. Also, some of the solutions that I would recommend would be that after we go through this mass grave episode is to get the Greenwood Historic District National Park Service nomination done. It's been over 10 years uh, that we've tried to get that historic designation and we're still attempting to get it. The uh, Greenwood District, in case you all didn't know, that a resolution was signed by the city that gives the boundaries of the Greenwood District. It is Frisco Railroad to the south, Pine Street to the north, Lansing to the east, Martin Luther King on the west side. Also, the National Park Service has identified those some same boundaries uh, as the city has. And why that's pertinent is because, and this is probably if no one else knows this in here, is that District 4 downtown, their city council is over the historic buildings down on Greenwood. They're not in District 1. We need to get that back to District 1, and since there's a census coming up, Maybe if we rally hard enough and get those boundaries changed back to District 1, we'd be wasting our time in here trying to move our economic and social conditions to a better place.
share in detail of the families uh, who are doing this and uh, the depth and knowledge that Mr. Kevin Ross and many of you have on this issue. And certainly want to thank our chair of the Black Caucus, Representative Regina Goodman, for your work on this. I do want to answer one of your questions, Mr. Reed. Uh, we had the commission had a uh, meeting today, and we got a report from Mr. Ruben Gant that's continued the National Park designation. They have actually come here and already had their visit. Uh, the person that, uh, that, the black woman that wrote it the first time, uh, we want to be enlisting her because they're looking at those boundaries to include the whole district now. And so that National Park designation is moving forward. They have made the visit, the site visit. That is moving forward now. And I want to thank you for your previous work on this, but that is moving forward. I just want to make uh, public aware that we get ready to have about three or four community meetings to give uh, more reports to the community and to get the community input on uh, 100 days experience and some other things. But I wanted to let you know families know another that that destination is happening. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to uh, briefly give some context. And uh, as you know, Mr. Green, we, we met with the author of the previous uh, nomination. So we know that that's in the works. Um, Mr. Wright spoke about New York Tavern, and that's a very uh, sensitive subject. That was a very good friend of mine, I did his eulogy. And one of the things I'll say, I've heard a lot of people thank the mayor because this is a courageous act. The mayor was a councilman when we were fighting for the Brady Street name change. And we went to Leroy Captain, myself and Arisa B. Christie. And that was, he was resistant to it. He was like, no, I think this, that's not the right way to go. You know, we need to do something different, but we convinced him otherwise. <laughs> uh, and we did our research. But we are not delusional about this work. We're not delusional about the fact that you can't successfully cover up almost 100 years of injustice without some real deep stuff happening in the background. So we're justified in giving credit to this entire community, this entire committee, for the courage that it's gonna to take to do the work that we have to do. We're just starting. I say that to say, I recall when the, the previous mayor told us be careful, you walk in a slippery slope. Why are they told us this? And I didn't understand, I didn't have a full understanding about what that meant until Leroy's passing. Because just before his passing, we were about to do some deep, deep, deep research on the plan roles. You know, because we started to understand that a lot of people are not going to come forward because of their relationship to the clan and their clan affiliations that were tied to their political affiliation. So we understand a lot of what, the, we understand the depth of the work that we're trying to do here. And it is a crime scene. And, I, and it's, it's so uh, appropriate that the mayor has chosen to deal with it under this guise, under this, you know, with these terms. One of the, my best friends, West, Wesley uh, Young, he said, she's never let them forget what has happened to us because there's no statute of limitations on murder. He's been saying this to me for decades, long before this even came up. So we knew that, okay, we just gotta get the ball rolling. We have to keep make sure that we never let people forget this history and we continue to do what we were destined to do. So I want you all to really be patient with this committee because this work is going to be laborious. It's going to be a real test of our character and our commitment to 
what we're trying to do in this city that has never ever been done. People have said, we've been in this position before, but we haven't been this far. We didn't deal with it in this context, right? We, we didn't have a strategy that we're using now. So I just really hope that people will continue to tell their stories and we'll continue to listen. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm currently a producer of a film, a, a feature film on Black Wall Street. Some of the research we've done has come from, some of the help has come from white citizens who are telling their stories. And you won't believe some of the stuff that is covered up. So I just want you all to stay committed, stay, stay informed and research, do your research, do your diligence to do research so that you can understand why we may take certain positions or take certain groups and do certain things. Because the work we have to do is, it's a ritual. I mean, it really is a ritual process. Like uh, once somebody said, it's a spiritual thing. And it's very spiritual. So just be with us, support us, and help us in every way that you can. Thank you. Uh, thank you for reminding us about uh, it being a crime scene. So um, a few weeks ago, I uh, did go with my friend uh, Kevin Ross out to this cemetery. And uh, everything that uh, he described and uh, his friend described is true. One of the uh, things that we saw was is that people are people in that community over there are starting to pull their uh, trash and Christmas trees and that type of stuff, and they're just dragging them back there. And so I don't know if there's any way to, you know, block that off if it's a crime scene, but maybe we should treat it as one, at least for now. Uh, I just feel, I just feel that prayer. Amen. Amen. Uh, when is at the end? I was just, you know, we didn't show up with prayer, but I want to end with prayer. Uh, if, if everyone has spoken, I just think it's, it would be proper to pray. We're going to need a whole lot of prayer to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. It's going to take a lot of work. And we can't do this without God's help. How many believe in prayer? Right, amen. And, and it's going to happen. So, is anybody else? I'm just feeling that prayer. Yeah. I just want to encourage uh, all of you that are here and those who are not here to spread the word is that we welcome your feedback, we welcome your comments and your stories. So this is not the only time that you're going to get comments. So every time you have a meeting, you know, we will have that opportunity. So we do welcome that. So we want to encourage you to get this part of the evening. Please fill them out so you can get them to the city of Boston. Or you can go online. But we do want to feedback back and we do want to restore. So I just want to make sure that uh, you know that. And I think the next meeting, if I understand, will be July 17th. The 18th. The 18th. The 18th. The 18th. So the next meeting will be July 18th uh, at the Bookfield Library. And thank you again for coming out. Thank you for that tour. Five thirty on July 18th. Again, thank you so much for coming out this evening and sharing your story because we really need them and we want them to be part of the document. But one of the things that I was grateful enough to, to, to experience was that you know for so many years the uh, story about the uh, race massacre, I have to keep remembering this massacre so when we did study the riots. But the wonderful thing that was we were able to achieve was finally get the survivors to start talking. And so some of those uh, things are recorded and uh, housed at the Greenwood Culture Center. So we did have the opportunity to have them to come forward and have many of them. So that's a lot of that Document. And so if you get an opportunity to also go to the Greenwood Culture Center and explore uh, some of the things that, that are out there, the history is there, because there, there is documentation there. So I do again say thank you for coming out this evening. We know we have a lot to do, a lot of work to achieve, 
but it's where it started at the state level, but the city is going to wrap it up. <laughs> I, um, I just really want to thank all of you who came out tonight. I want to thank all of you who've been willing to commit to this. I think, Chief, you said it so well. I mean, this is going to be a difficult process. We have to be mindful that uh, this could be this could be years that we're talking about this if we're doing it the right way um, but this morning I was talking with my wife and she asked me you know, how are you feeling about the meeting tonight and I said I'm really anxious because there's so much pain around this issue in our community and we haven't had a venue for people to talk about this pretty much ever and I don't know when we give people the chance to talk about it how they're going to react to it. And it's just incredibly moving to be up here and to see person after person come up here. Every single person who spoke to me came to talk about what they can do to do right by the folks who got murdered in 1921. Every person. And every person has a different skill set or knowledge, or an area where they can play a part in this. And I know I talked earlier about what a disgrace it is that, that we've had to wait this long. And I mean, Kevin, I appreciate you mentioning I'm the first mayor to work on this. I immediately turned it up for all Harper when he said that, and said, that's a shame <laughs> that's the case. <laughs> but what strikes me is that tonight's meeting is about what we choose for Tulsa to be about now. Not the decision that others have made in the past to try to put this out of sight, out of mind, or not talk about it because it's shameful on the history of our city, but to be open about it and to talk about what we can do to honor our neighbors who got killed. And so I'm just so thankful for each of you for coming here in that spirit and for the work that we're going to do moving forward in that spirit. And, and Bishop, when you talk about praying, I've just been sitting out here thinking about those folks and where they are right now and looking down on this room and thinking about the work that we're going to do to do right now. So I really appreciate it. You lead us in prayer. Now your heads if you go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you on this evening. We're so thankful, oh God, that we've come together as a people. We're so thankful, oh God, for this committee. We're thankful for Maxine, Vanessa, the mayor, the staff, all of those that are working together for the common good of our community. Lord, we come before you to ask you to help us, oh God. But Lord, we cannot do this without you. We need your help. We need your strength, oh God, to be able to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Lord, we pray for and ask for your guidance and your direction. Lord, because we need that. We believe by faith, oh God, that if we trust you, and if we stay together, that you will guide our steps. You will bless us to be able to find those, those mass graves, oh God. And Lord, from that point, you will be able to direct us and to guide us. Oh God, you're omniscient, you're all knowing, omnipotent, you're all powerful, and I'm not present everywhere at the same time. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you for the seriousness. We thank you for the mayor, oh God. The man that you chose for this hour. It's been overdue, God. It's been overdue. Our time is now. And Father, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. For you are just. You are just, God. Oh God, we come against all injustice. We know, oh God, you will bring justice. Father, we thank you for all of those who gathered tonight. We 
thank you for the testimonials. We thank you for those who, who heard from tonight, those voices that we needed to hear from. As we continue to work over the months and years to come, Lord, let us not just be active and busy and not accomplish anything, but let us, oh God, accomplish that that need to be accomplished. We thank you for unity. We thank you for one accord. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Amen.